Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Filter. On this show, we recognize that the world can be a confusing place to live in. So what I seek to do on this show is to equip you to live with biblical clarity in our confusing world so that you can face the chaos of life with wisdom, integrity, and courage. Masculinity is a hot topic today in our swirling debates around gender and sexuality. Both in the church and the broader culture, people argue over the fundamental differences, roles, and definitions of masculinity and femininity. My guest on today's show has an approach to considering the nature of masculinity, which doesn't rely on cultural stereotypes, but instead looks at the motivating heart of a man. His name is Chase Replogle, and we discussed his new book, The Five Masculine Instincts. Chase Replogle is the pastor of Bent Oak Church in Springfield, Missouri. He holds a degree in Biblical Studies and an MA in New Testament from the Assemblies of God Theological Seminary. Chase is the author of The Five, Five Masculine Instincts. His work has been featured on Good Morning America, Christianity Today, The Gospel Coalition, Ecstasis, Bible Engagement Project, and Influence Magazine. In addition, he hosts the Pastor Writer Podcast, where he interviews Christian authors on writing and publishing. A native of the Ozark Woods, he enjoys being outdoors with his wife and two kids, sailing, playing the guitar, and quail hunting with his bird dog, Millie. Before we get into this episode, let me encourage you to subscribe to our email list so that you can get all future content sent directly into your inbox. Just visit the link in the show notes and you can get signed up on my website. Also, be sure that you are subscribed to Filter wherever you get your podcasts so that all future episodes are, will show up right on your homepage. If you're helped by this content, we'd really appreciate it if you left us a rating and review and shared the show with your friends. Leave Filter a five-star rating on Spotify and write a review on Apple Podcasts. It will only take a minute of your time, but when you take these simple steps, it greatly helps us to get the message of biblical clarity out to more people. Well, without any further delay, let's jump into my conversation with Chase Replogle. Chase, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's an honor and a privilege and looking forward to a good conversation as well. Yeah, well, glad that you're here. Uh, I've been uh, looking at your book for a while and uh, and just got a copy from you that I've been reading and uh, been following your podcast for a while called uh, Pastor Writer. And so it's an honor to have you on. Uh, glad to be able to talk to you. Tell us a little bit about yourself with uh, how you got started doing the podcast, uh, which is on being a passionate writer, and then now with your first published book. Uh, just tell us the story behind that. Yeah, well, thanks. Well, first and foremost, I'm a pastor. So I uh, pastor a small congregation in Springfield, Missouri. I live in the Ozarks, if you're familiar with that area. And uh, I've, books have always been really important to me through, through college and, and on into pastoring. So much of what I do as a pastor relates back in some way to the books that have shaped me or the books that are informing my preaching. And I think those people who really love to read, you always sort of wonder, well, could I do that too? What would, what would it look yeah. like if I at least tried? And so several years back, I started working on some more of my writing. So a lot of that was articles and blogs and the podcast came along for a couple of reasons. Those early episodes were a lot about writing. I was just trying to talk to writers and learn about writing and then has evolved through 200 episodes to conversations on books with authors. So most of what I do today is just interview Christian authors about books that I find interesting and conversations around them. And then this past March was uh, honored to be able to put out my first book, The Five Masculine Instincts, which is the culmination. Uh, if you're a listener to the podcast, you know several years worth of work and the difficult process of getting a book published that's gone into it. But it's uh, it's been such a joy and such an honor to have that book finally out there. And for people like you to give it the time to read it, I, I take all of that very seriously and appreciate it a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I know from my own research that that's a really hard journey. And um uh, a lot of people, you know, really get intimidated, so they don't even start. And then a lot of people just quit without persevering all the way through. And so congratulations to you. Uh, it, it's certainly a, a great accomplishment. What do you think you learned through the process? Like, how, how did Chase change? Mm, that's a good question. Um, use the word perseverance, and I think that's the right one. So much of writing, but actually, one of the things I'm always interested in exploring with the podcast is where those where those lines of my vocation as a writer and pastor, where they intersect and they actually help each other. 
Uh, for me, those two are becoming more tightly integrated the more writing I do. It's hard to imagine doing the writing without pastoring and more and more the pastoring without writing. But in both of those vocations, as a writer and as a pastor, I think perseverance really is one of those core disciplines. You just keep showing up, you just keep putting in the work, and you keep trusting that God is at work doing things, sometimes when you can't see them, sometimes when it doesn't feel like it. Uh, mm -hmm. So much of the work of being a pastor is just being present, being with people, bringing God's word to people week after week after week. And I try to think less and less as a pastor about one Sunday or one sermon, but rather a decade of worshiping together with a group of people. And in the same way, I'm less and less thinking of my writing as just a single article or even a single book. But what does it look like over a lifetime to just continue to write and grow at it? So I think perseverance, your word you used a minute ago, is a really good one. lesson that I've been learning these last few years. Yeah, excellent. And that applies to us, whether we're writers, pastors, uh, parents, anything else. Um, I think a lot of us today need perseverance um, because we live in a culture where we, we value ease, comfort. Um, we value things being quick. And so uh, I think perseverance is a virtue that is probably on short supply today. Yeah, we're, we're real quick to make judgments about things too, aren't we? Like we try something and if we're not good at it, we move on to something else really quick. Or we, uh, we put something out in the world and if it doesn't immediately sort of blow up or turn into something, then well, that must not be the yeah. thing we move on to something out. But you think about all the things that matter most in life, relationships and marriage and your family and those skills you do acquire, they're all things that take years, not days or months to cultivate. Mm. And the longer you stick with them, the more depth and enjoyment comes through them. I like that idea of an acquired taste, right? That there mm -hmm. are some really good things in life that the truth is just take time for you to fully acquire the appreciation for. So yeah, I think it's a lesson for all of us. That's great. And so how did you become a pastor? What was your, when did you experience the call to that? Or what was your journey like to becoming a pastor? Yeah, well, my plan was to go to law school. Uh, I was pretty big into speech and debate in high school and had some scholarship opportunities to debate teams and at some decent schools. And I uh, went to a summer camp as a, uh, between my junior and senior year, and uh, I was a believer and really felt a strong sense that I was supposed to go to Bible college and become a pastor. And so those were some tough conversations explaining to my debate coach and parents, I want to give up all of those scholarships to schools you've heard of and go to this little Bible college that no one has heard of. Uh, yeah. But I look back and the Lord was in it. I think it was uh, absolutely what he was leading me to do. And uh, since then, that sense of, of wanting to be a pastor and just wanting to be present in people's lives, bring the word of God into people's lives, that's become more and more clear as time's gone by. And, and so uh, I'm grateful for the way he's led that, uh, ups and downs and sometimes second guesses. But uh, like the writing, there's a certain inevitability I feel to it. It just feels like this is who I am and what God's asked me to do. And one way or another, it's going to work itself out. Yeah, yeah, great. And so your book is called The Five Masculine Instincts. Um, I think right off the bat, one of the things that caught my attention with the book is that it's on masculine instincts, which is something that I've never heard of before. Um, and so tell us about um, how you started writing a book on masculinity. Like, what is it about, um, what is it, whether it was a need in your life, a need in your congregation's life, or just something that you saw in our world today and culture that worked up in you this desire to write a book for men yeah it's probably a combination of those things i wouldn't i wouldn't say that i'm a, a men's author only certainly the the other books or the other things that i've worked on and am working on are not just for men but i have a congregation full of men i'm raising a son as well and i've watched over the last few years as it's well, it's not only become confusing, in some ways it's become controversial. Uh, it's, it's harder and harder to talk about what it means to be a man or a Christian man in this culture. And I've seen a lot of pastors and churches and really families as well that have just distanced themselves from that conversation because of some of the, the complexity around trying to have it. And when we do have those conversations, they tend to be about external things. So in the culture, we spend a lot of time paying attention to men's behavior or the kind of caricatures of masculinity. And even in the church, we spend a lot of time looking at the roles men should play. If you bring up a conversation about who a man should be, you almost immediately move into discussions, sometimes debates around a man's role in his family or in a congregation. And what struck me was those things matter. Those are important conversations. I certainly have opinions on them like just about everyone else, but I don't think simply giving a man a new responsibility or a role 
guarantees that he has the character necessary to bear that responsibility or that role well. And mm -hmm. the thing we very rarely turn our attention to is that internal conversation of how do I grow in character? How do I just become a better man? And for me, that question is really a question of the instincts. C.S. Lewis uses a definition for instinct, uh, that an instinct is behavior as if from knowledge. So in other words, those external things, the way we act and live, those behaviors, we assume that we've made decisions and we're doing it out of some rationality that we've previously thought through, when in reality, when they're instincts, often we haven't. We're acting, we're living out this behavior, having never really considered why we're doing it or what the root of it is. And as a pastor, you learn pretty quick that two men can, can sin in the exact same way. They can carry out the same sin, but they can be motivated to that disobedience by very different instincts or very different desires within themselves. And to really get at the root of why I'm behaving the way I am or why I'm wrestling with the temptations that I am, you've got to push deeper than those external disobedient questions and try to track down into the heart to understand what are these ways of living or these assumptions I've made, these instincts that are leading to my behavior that I really haven't given enough attention to or questioned? I think that's really the path forward for us as men. And I also think it's the path forward through some of the controversy. I think it's a way of talking about manhood and who men should be today that helps us avoid some of the, the lines that have already been drawn that seem to be stunting the conversation instead of actually helping mm -hmm. us as men. Yeah. So how do you differentiate between what you're calling instincts versus just uh, what we would call character virtues uh, or maybe the desires and affections of the heart? Uh, how do you how do you how does your understanding of what the instincts are interact with these other ideas that we have and typically refer to where we talk about behavior and character mm -hmm. and so on? Yeah, so it's important to say that these instincts are not the five expectations of men, that you have to have these instincts in order to qualify as a man. That's certainly not what I'm saying. Nor are these five instincts the, the five sins of men, that these are the things you've got to watch out for or else they're going to, you know, they're going to become sins in your life. Uh, I think all of the instincts that I cover in the book are at least neutral, but most of them I think are actually positive things. But where they tend to go wrong is when they become the sole impulse, the thing driving our behavior, and they go unchecked and unrecognized within us. That's the thing that I'm really most concerned about with men is we're not teaching men how to pay attention to what's going on inside of themselves, what's motivating mm. and driving their character, their behavior. Um, culture spends millions of dollars creating ad campaigns to try to tell men the, what you're doing is wrong, to describe toxic forms of masculinity. When men show up to church, we tend to talk about the masculine sins, sometimes money, sex, and power. But very rarely do we get to the conversation of saying, well, what are some of those possibly even good things in your life that you're pursuing in a way that is unchecked and blindly indulged that could actually become destructive things because they're the only thing you're basing your behavior on? Um, so I think the right way of thinking about instincts is things driving your behavior that have, you've not paid attention to, things that you are, you've assumed and are living out but have never really questioned. The philosopher Nietzsche uh, has a place where he says that your instincts are weakened when you force them to rationalize themselves. So in other words, when you start to ask hard questions about why I do the things I do, you actually weaken the control those things have over you. You start to gain better perspective on yourself. And as a part of that process, you actually gain a little more control for your own behavior. You gain the opportunity mm -hmm. of making better choices and putting in place in your life some disciplines that lead to real character, real virtue, uh, in the way I describe in the book, real Christ-likeness, that when you just blindly indulge those impulses, you really don't have a chance of finding. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting. So I like that. So that's why, so I think that's why instincts is a good word for it, because it's it's a uh, deep-seated desire or inclination towards some action, which in and of itself may not be wrong, uh, but if pursued solely or above all other things, or certainly above God's desire and what he tells us to do for, with our lives, then it can be driven in destructive, sinful, <clears throat> yeah, if it in toxic ways. So or controlling. If it becomes yeah. so controlling that you aren't able to check it, or you're not even aware that it's there, to you, yeah. this is Lewis's definition, behavior as if from knowledge, to you that, that instinct feels like 
truth and common sense, that this is just the way the world works. And so you lose the possibility of entertaining other ways of acting or other ways of considering. So you really become enslaved to this instinct instead of recognizing that that instinct could be matured and be checked and then used towards something good. Instead, you become ruled by it and you live instinctively. Um, there's a place in the book of Jude where it talks about this instinct as if uh, like an animal, where we have this impulse, this desire to act without ever considering. And so we become more animal than man. And that's my risk for men that we just, at worst case, assume that these instincts are masculinity, that to be mm. a man is to indulge those instincts without question. And so we sort of lock ourselves into this stunted version of ourselves where growth really becomes less and less possible yeah and so the five instincts that you write about are uh let me see sarcasm adventure ambition reputation and apathy so what makes these the masculine instincts like um versus do you think that these are instincts that women can struggle with as well in other words what makes them uniquely masculine instincts Sure. So I do think obviously these are, I don't think there's such a hard line between instincts men and women experience. Um, I think they're generally speaking are things that resonate with men as I talk about them that may not resonate in the same way with all women. Um, certainly part of the reason I'm wanting to have this conversation with men is because the culture is robbing us of that conversation with men. We're finding it harder and harder to have conversations about manhood. So I think it's more important than ever to try to bring men to these topics. Um, mm -hmm. And it's also probably good to say that I don't think these are the exclusive instincts as if any impulse you ever felt towards behavior is somehow in one of these five. I'm, I'm sure there's plenty of other instincts. At the base level of this book, though, I'm using these five instincts to try to show men how to pay more attention to their inner life. So if through the book you learn to do that, then you may discover other things at work within your heart or within mm. your instincts, even beyond these. It's really trying to learn the pattern. Uh, yeah. Those specific five instincts, sarcasm, and amb amb uh, adventure, ambition, reputation, and apathy, come from one of Shakespeare's famous monologues. There's a play, uh, As You Like It, and in the play there's a monologue, the opening words will be familiar. Uh, All the world's a stage, and each of us men and women have our entrance and our exits, and a man in his day plays many parts. And Shakespeare goes on to describe these seven stages of a man's life. Uh, the first of those is birth, the last of them is death, and then in between you get these five stages that depict a man from really what would be childhood, school age, to what we might consider retirement. And so what I tried to do with the book was give a single word to each of those five Shakespearean stages and then mm -hmm. pair them with a biblical character so that you could read the biblical story and begin to recognize the instinct at work in that character's life and then so through it recognize it in your own life as well. Yeah. Yeah. So which one of those do you think um, would be one of your like which one of them as you were working on it, writing on it, stood out as like this is one of the instincts that is uh, one of the driving ones in my life, whether it be one that has really led me in righteous direction or one that I've had to rein in and learn how to not make, uh, you know, my major major instinct, if you want to put it that way, uh, yeah. which one would be like the most core to you? Sure. So I think the instincts are, I think they're less like personality types. I am one thing. And they are, as mm -hmm. you're describing them, the sort of, all of these probably exist to some degree and it's seasons in life or situations in life. Some of them may feel stronger in their instinct, their impulse to us. Um, I actually have a little online assessment at the five masculine instincts.com. It's nothing scientific, but 25 questions. You can take that exam and it'll show you based on your answers, which of these five might be strongest. And usually when I do that assessment or when I read the book and wrote it and thought about myself chapter by chapter, probably for me, the strongest one is ambition, uh, which makes some sense. I'm a pastor. I'm a writer. There's nothing like doing those good things, you know, holy, sacred things for God that at times there can be a temptation or an instinct to make those too important in my life, to begin to define myself and everything around me by those works that I'm doing. So I usually try to keep a pretty close close watch on, again, ambition being a good thing. Uh, certainly mm -hmm. 
I don't want a generation of ambitionless men. That's not what I'm calling for. But I recognize within my own life and Moses, who I use in the book to look at ambition, that those good ambitions can actually become obsessions or desperations in our life and can lead to, lead to very real disobedience as happens in Moses' life. So that's the one I'm usually keeping a, a, a the particularly close watch on in my own life. Yeah. And so other than taking the online assessment, what are the ways that you teach for men to be able to start to recognize the different instincts at play in their own life um, and how to start to uh, evaluate them and uh, not be ruled by them, channel them into righteous behavior? So um, I use in the book a little piece of advice that the Apostle Paul gives to the young man, Timothy. Timothy was pastoring in a really difficult place uh, in Ephesus where there was all sorts of conflict and he was struggling to root out false teaching and he was younger and being sort of looked down upon for that. And Paul told Timothy that he would make progress by learning to keep a close watch on his life and on the teaching, the doctrine, which is shorthand for the gospel. And Paul went on to say that by this, you would save both yourself and your hearers, which I think is language about responsibility. You'll bear responsibility well in the tasks you've been given if you learn to pay close attention to your life and close attention to what you have in Christ through the gospel. So in each of the, the five instincts, that's really the thing I'm trying to help men do. How, how do I use this biblical story of a man begin to recognize and ask questions about, is this instinct at work within my own life, paying close attention to my life, and then also recognize the way that that instinct gets checked, and through God's grace, that biblical character often overcomes that instinct, and that likewise, through what I have in Christ, I too can overcome that instinct. And one of the reasons I think the biblical characters as a way into the instincts is so important is, good stories allow us to learn lessons as if we had lived them without having to have lived them. Um, mm. Certainly, if you've read through the scriptures, you know there's some of these stories that just become really important to us. There's characters we begin to identify with. There's senses we have of myself in, the, in this story like this character. And so my hope is that as you're reading about these five men in the Bible and their struggle with these five instincts, you'll begin to recognize some of your own life, some of your own tendencies in their story. And so by it, you can learn uh, as if firsthand, but really secondhand from the way that they struggle with those instincts as well. Yeah. So when we start to recognize the different instincts and how they are at play in our own lives, what is what is like the practical outworking of this? You know, so because I, I, I think there'd be a lot of men who are listening and saying this is great uh, and I need something like this. They recognize the need for it. But then once they start to recognize the, the instincts, you know, I, I think men are usually interested in, well, like, what is the yeah, what what do is I do? the the real implications? What do I do with it? Right. And so how do you help men to figure out with the connection from seeing the instinct in their heart to how it plays out in their life? Because I know, like you said in the beginning of the book, in the beginning of the conversation, how you don't want to just focus on behavior, right? Because that'd be surface level. And that's where a lot of very superficial debates happen. But at a certain point in this conversation, we go from the deep up to the surface, right? And so how do you make that connection? And how do we, we know that the instincts are leading to the right behaviors and so on? Yeah, well, I really like the way you framed that too, because these two things are connected, right? What's happening internal is leading to behavior. I mean, that's part of what we've already been describing. Instincts are behavior as if from knowledge. So these instincts are already driving your behavior. So it's not a matter of ignoring behavior. But I think what most men need is when they begin to recognize some of these instincts at work within themselves. Again, it's not as simple as to say, oh, I'm struggling with ambition, therefore I should give up ambition. That's what makes this conversation so challenging and what makes the work actually challenging as well. We have to do something more complicated than that, which is we have to make sure that those instincts, ambition and reputation and adventure, not that we, we ignore them, but that we put them in their proper place. And I think the way that you do that is you do need some intentional action, you need some behavior, but you need certain behaviors that will check those instincts and ensure that we're not allowing them to become something more than they should be. For a long time, the Christian tradition has taught these various spiritual disciplines, and those disciplines really aren't about the acts themselves. It's not as if, look, I fasted and I prayed, therefore I've earned points for doing it, right? The actions are really about trying to cultivate and change who I am as a person 
through these disciplines that I put into my life. In the same way that if I go work out and lift weights, the real goal is not just that I would be able to lift the weights, it's that I would become stronger, I would be changed and transformed by that discipline. So for each of these instincts in the book, I offer a kind of intentional practice that I think is a tool that you could implement in your life for checking those instincts. So to kind of run through each of them real quick and then we could jump into wherever you want or other topics, but for, um, for the instinct of sarcasm, I recommend humility and meekness and an intentional practice of it. For adventure, I recommend a practice of discernment. What does it look like to become more discerning? For ambition, as we've been talking about a little already, an intentional practice of Sabbath and how Sabbath can be an important check on ambition. For reputation, the practice of confession, which I don't just mean I go to a person and confess a sin, but a real lifestyle of confession, even before God, of, of uh, owning all of what is taking place in my life and confessing all of it. David, I think, is a model. And then with apathy, Abraham, an intentional practice of sacrifice, that there should be things in your life that you're w intentionally and willingly sacrificing to keep your faith engaged so that apathy doesn't become too strong. So yeah, I think the way you asked the question was really wise and insightful. There does at some point, as we jump into this deep dive, paying close attention to my life, there does have to become then that second work of, now what do I have in Christ that I can use as a discipline to check those instincts and through those two works begin to make progress to become a better man mm -hmm. so what is the why i'm interested in, in some of the uh in, in some of the reasoning behind choosing the practices that go with the the instincts so like particularly apathy and the practice being sacrifice why sacrifice for apathy what's the connection so all of the actions come out of the biblical stories as well. So that's, uh, I don't see myself as some sort of a physician who's saying, well, here, I, I've made the diagnosis. I yeah. know the cure for it. Uh, those, those actions that I'm seeing are the very actions that God is leading these men into as a way of helping them recognize and check those instincts. Yeah. Okay. So to do it quickly, and I use Abraham to talk about apathy. And Abraham has this tendency in his life, when things get very complicated, he tends to struggle to engage the complexity. It's surprising because he's really a man of faith. I mean, he's the father of faith as we describe him. But yet, take examples like when um, his wife Sarah comes and says, since she was barren, let's produce that heir we've been waiting for from Hagar, my servant. Well, Abraham mm -hmm. passively goes along. And then when Hagar gives birth to Ishmael, and there's now conflict between his wife, Sarah, and the servant, Hagar, Sarah comes to him and says, look at all this complexity, these conflict in our home. And Abraham says to her, well, you deal with it. He just passively disengages. She begins mistreating Hagar, and Hagar flees into the wilderness. I mean, the whole family just falls apart because really of his inability to step into that complexity. There's a kind of false ending that happens in Abraham's story, where Abraham finally settles in Beersheba, he plants a tamarisk tree there. It's kind of an image of retirement, plant, putting down roots. He signs peace treaties with his neighbors. He's wealthy. Finally, Isaac, that promised son, was born. And you expect the, to turn the page from the end of Genesis chapter 21 and take up Isaac's story. But instead, you turn the page and you read, but God tested Abraham. And he asks Abraham to sacrifice his son. Now, I think the most dangerous moment in Abraham's life was not the moment in which he was following God, in which he was uh, coming into conflict with kings or going, setting out through deserts and famines. I think the most dangerous moment in his life was when he had everything he had waited for, when his faith was no longer something that moved him forward. He certainly still believed in God and had faith in God, but there was no active living reason for his faith. And that yeah. retirement settling down really runs the risk of his faith fizzling out. And I think God tests him and calls him to sacrifice for a lot of reasons. But partly I think he does it to wake his faith back up and ensure that Abraham, even when he has everything he's been waiting for, is still living by faith and still that father of faith. So for men who are struggling with apathy, uh, what is the intentional practice? Well, I try to do the very thing God was doing in Abraham's life. Are there tests or are there things God is asking you to sacrifice? Perhaps just the simplicity of your hobbies or your own time, your schedule, that in reality, you need to be willing to give up to keep your faith active and alive when you find yourself giving into that apathy, that tendency towards the instinct to disengage. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And I, so I think there's so many like tangential uh, 
issues connected to apathy, whenever you describe it that way. One of them that I'm thinking of is the issue of control and how I think a lot of us can be tempted to have full, tight grip control over our lives um, so that we can then like be apathetic, right? Mm -hmm. So we can uh, like, so once Abraham got into that situation where he was very comfortable, everything was under his control, he didn't need God. Right, so if we can keep everything under control, then we 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 don't need faith. Yeah, and it's uh, and so easy God for us to calls start us doing to. That. Yeah. We start doing that by actually intentionally withdrawing from what we can't control. Right, so we look at the world and we say those relationships are too complicated. Those social issues are never going to get solved. That job that I've given so much time to, I'm, like I'm done. And we can actually w retreat back into a small world that feels like it's in control, our hobbies mm -hmm. and our like, recliner and our, you know, the little safe space that we've created for ourselves, And we think we're protecting it, but in reality, we're, we're risking so much when we do it because we're, we're no longer following God into what he's doing. Look at what Abraham receives by faith. We're now trying to hoard what we alone can protect by our own, our own control, our own abilities. And so by it really f sacrificing that engagement of God in our life. Yeah. Yeah, we can be withdrawn from so many things that God's calling us to because we we perceive that we are not going to be only be in control of the calling, in control of the situation, the outcome of it. And so we just don't step into it and we're apathetic. Um, and so, yeah, so God calls us into these moments of sacrifice, moments of having to let go and not be in control to grow our faith and pull us out of apathy. That's really good. That's really good. Another one, another one that I was interested in is adventure and discernment explain the the connection there and the story behind uh that one so for adventure i use the story of samson and there's a cultural narrative right now that says that to know your true identity who you really are and to find a meaningful life you have to be willing to leave home to leave tradition to leave place and people and faith and to go find yourself out in the world in some sort of epic quest that's going to reveal to you your true identity. Um, it's every movie that our kids are watching. I often use Moana as an example, right? Like you may have this responsibility and tradition in people, but you've got to be willing to leave it to go find yourself on this quest. Mm -hmm. I read Samson's story that way. Samson grows up at a, not a particularly high point of Israel's culture. They don't have a centralized government or a place of worship. They're really just sort of scraping out a living in the hills. They're being raided by all their neighbors. Every time they get crops, somebody writes in and takes them. And at the same time, Philistia down on the coastal plains is at a high point. They're having breakthroughs in technology, new metals. They're ridiculously wealthy with these major cities. And so it's not surprising that a young man, Samson, who, by the way, also doesn't decide to take the Nazarite vow, no cutting hair or touching corpse or drinking wine. That was given to him by his mother who received it from an angel before his birth. So Samson's growing up in kind of a backwards place with kind of an odd family tradition. Well, it's not surprising that he would find himself looking down on Philistia and being increasingly obsessed with everything Philistine, constantly going down to Philistia. And story after story, you get these little adventure cycles where he quests down to this place, finds himself in danger and risk. The spirit comes over him, this miraculous strength that delivers him. And you would think that after all of those accumulating experiences of adventure, that Samson would become more enlightened, that he would discover more his purpose and his identity and his uniqueness. But instead, he becomes less discerning. He becomes more dull. He usually takes those experiences and either gambles them away in sort of drunken parties or boasts about them in songs and puns about himself. And in the end, everything betrays him. It's not just Delilah, but it's this whole epic adventure quest of going down to Philistia that fails to deliver on those things. He doesn't become a better version of himself. He becomes less and less himself, eventually chained to a wall and his eyes gouged out and his head shaved and his strength gone. He loses himself in the process. So I use that chapter to try to say to men, again, there's nothing wrong with doing something adventurous. Go hike a mountain, go on that kayaking trip. I like to sail, go, go do it. There's nothing wrong. But if that need for adventure becomes the controlling impulse of your life, your hope for meaning and identity and purpose and self-discovery, well, don't be surprised if it doesn't deliver those things. And it actually leaves you, weakens your commitments and costs you those things you're looking for, betrays you. 
And the reason I call for um, discernment as an intentional practice here, I think discernment through commitment, sticking with something long enough to begin to recognize the value in it, is that that's the very thing that Samson was struggling to do, to see the way that God was offering him what he was looking for, this adventurous narrative of his life. But it was by submission to God, not by pursuing himself, that Samson would find it. One of my favorite lines from that chapter is there's a poet who is advising another young poet, and he says to the young poet, don't blame your life for being too boring to draw material from, but blame yourself for not being poetic enough to recognize the material in your life. And I think that's how it is with God's calling. Um, when you have the mortgage payment and the car payment and the dog and the two kids and the cubicle job, and you feel like, how did it end up here? You know, where's the adventure? It's not that your life lacks adventure. It's that you haven't cultivated enough discernment to recognize what God is doing in those places. And the way by his grace and his faithfulness, it is leading to something meaningful. You just in the middle of it can't quite see it yet. Mm. Yeah, I almost see adventure and apathy as being uh, like on opposite poles of a similar instinct. Mm-hmm. One being uh, a an inclination to withdraw, and the other being an inclination to overdo, <laughs> yeah. right? Or, or 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 go, and so therefore, you know, being willing to give up control, go into step into things that might involve risk, discomfort. Uh, the the adventurer has no problem with that, but the adventurer needs the discernment to know when to, you know. Uh, not step into them or step into j- or just into the right adventures and and so on. So that, that's really good. Uh, that's great. I really appreciate that. You know, one thing that I keep going back to in my mind is um, is how do these instincts interact with maybe or or or, or I'm having a hard time even articulating it. There's the masculine instincts, but are there also feminine instincts, and how do those interact? You know, and, and where's the overlap? And uh, or or did God design men with certain instincts and women with certain instincts? You know, what what is the um, you know what what's underneath it all between the two expressions here? Um, I don't know. What, what are your thoughts on the interaction between the masculine and feminine in this sure. discussion? Yeah, so I want to be careful to say that I don't think these five masculine instincts I cover are necessarily. I don't think the categories themselves are biblical in that I didn't pull these specifically from scripture and say, oh, look, God has clearly described these five instincts. I mean, I take this from Mm -hmm. Shakespeare, who's trying to write about human nature, one of our great writers, psychological writers of human nature, and one of our great observers. And I also think it's true that as I've talked about these with men, I've seen the way they resonate in their lives. I've also seen the way that women recognize their husbands and sons in these instincts. So I certainly, generally speaking, think there's something of human nature here. And I think you do see these instincts at work in the men of the Bible. So I don't think they're 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 uh, antagonistic to the scriptural stories. I think there's some congruence there. But I do think these are certainly instincts that women can experience. There's I'm raising a son and a daughter. And certainly there is huge overlap often, although there are also differences. And the way I write about this in the book is, um, I mentioned before, uh, my wife and I love to sail. We've got a little sailboat, nothing fancy, at a lake not far from our house. And I also like to read books on sailing. And one of the things I love reading about are these long ocean passages that sometimes even single-handed sailors will go on. And there's a famous route from Southern California to Hawaii that there's several books been written on. And when a sailor sets out to do that, sometimes they take an unexpected course. They'll actually sail south along the coast. Even if they set out from like LA, uh, San Francisco, they'll sail far south and then make their turn west to Hawaii because they need to pick up certain winds to actually make that trip quicker. So they'll almost sail away from the destination to get there quicker. If you're on a Mm -hmm. 200-ton cruise ship, you just point the bow at Honolulu and you're there in less than a week, right? So why such different courses? Well, they have the same destination, but the way they get there has a lot to do with the characteristics of the ship that they're on. I think that's the right way of thinking about us as men and women both following Christ. For men and women, we don't have a male savior and a female savior that we're trying to emulate. We're all emulating Mm -hmm. Christ likeness. We all have the Beatitudes. We all have the fruit of the Spirit. There's not masculine fruit of the Spirit and feminine fruit of the Spirit. We're all aiming ourselves at Christ but to make that destination, 
We also have to take into account the ship that we're on. We have to take into account the body that we've been given, the gender, both male and female, both called good in Genesis, that have certain um, chemical differences and hormonal differences. We also are raised in cultures that have different cultural expectations of men and women. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think part of growing in Christ-likeness is not abandoning the distinction of male and female but recognizing that I have to take responsibility for this gender, that by God's sovereignty, he's given me, and recognize that because of this gender, there are certain things or traits or experiences that I'm going to have to own and work towards Christ's likeness that at times may require slightly different tactics than someone else. I think that's also true just between us as men. men not all men are the exact same. That's why it mm -hmm. comes back to that piece of advice. You've got to learn to pay close attention to your life because at the end of the day, it's you bearing responsibility for those things and then recognizing what you have in Christ in the pursuit of him that leads you towards that destination of Christ likeness. So to come back to your original question, I think there's big overlap. I've had women read the book and I think it's helpful to all of them. I'm trying to have the conversation with men right now because I see so many that are disengaging and I see how our culture has set the bar so low for men and how men are often, uh, the conversations about manhood are often neglected in culture and within the church. So I think it matters right now in a particular way for men that we have these conversations. Uh, but yeah. certainly I think these instincts, there's probably more than these five instincts and certainly women could experience these as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I agree. I think it's really good that we identify these and uh, invite men into these conversations because so often, and this is something, once again, going back to something that you talk about in the book, um, in, in the culture, all that men are offered is either on the one side, uh, hey, come, come eat meat and shoot some guns and that's going to make us manly men, you know, <laughs> uh, yeah. or on the other hand, it's oh, you should just feel bad for being a man, right? Like you're disgusting, you're toxic, you know, you're toxic since you like meat and shooting guns. Like it's, it's one or the other. Um, and, and not really being invited into the, these careful, nuanced, and especially biblical conversations, uh, these conversations that are filled with God's wisdom. And so I, I think it's really important that we, that we do have those and that we, um, that we encourage men in these things. You know, I remember uh, last, so we're recording this after Father's Day. It's not going to come out for a few weeks, but uh, I saw this meme, a couple of memes uh, on, you know, how on Mother's Day at church, it's, oh, we love you and we're so grateful for you and you're amazing. And then on Father's Day, it's, you know, you guys suck. <laughs> you need to get better. You need to do better. And, and like, I, I see that same strain in the church and in the culture of whenever it comes to men just beating them down and making almost making them feel bad for being men and making them feel bad for having these instincts. It's one of the things that I do love about your book and what you're doing is saying, no, they're not bad. Uh, we need to yeah, apply some godly wisdom to them. Son. Raising a son yeah. and daughter, I, re I, I really feel this pretty profoundly because you know, I turn on the television, whether it's a commercial or a show, I see the amount of affirmation that's given to my daughter for being a woman, which, by the way, I agree with and support. Like, I yeah. want her to be everything she can be. I want her to, to, whatever God calls her to, to feel capable of doing it. I'm trying to raise a daughter who's intelligent and quick and, and smart, and I want everything for her. But I don't, as a father of a son and a daughter, I don't see how those things are mutually exclusive or a zero sum game for my son, that somehow for mm -hmm. my daughter to be empowered, he, my son has to be disempowered. My desire for yeah. both of them is growing in Christ likeness, that both would recognize that God making male and female and calling it good means that both of their genders are good. And it's a worthwhile responsibility to bear those genders towards Christ likeness. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think it's, I think it's increasingly an important thing. I actually, on Father's Day, uh, the morning of, I, I said, reminded my congregation, which sounds like such a strange thing to say, that it is good to be a man. By God's creation, it is a good thing. And you should be, you should be, bear that responsibility with joy, that it is good to become like Christ as a man and to be a man. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So I have a daughter and a son as well, and I see the same messages and concern about the the same issues. You know, I do love that there are so many stories and in, and in, in things now that encourage my my daughter to be to be strong and to be wise and to uh, to be adventurous and, and all these different things. You know, I don't always necessarily like the direction that they're being pushed in. Like, now here's what you should do with all that that strength and independence and so on. 
Uh, but then on the other hand, my son, yeah, I agree. I remember um, <laughs> whenever Frozen 2 came out, we took my daughter to the movie to see it. And my, my son was only, I can't remember, just a few months old at that point. And uh, so me and my wife and our little girl went to go see Frozen 2 because she loved the first one. And uh, I remember we were sitting there watching it. And the first one I thought was not a great movie, decent, had some okay parts. But we're sitting there watching the second one, which I was looking forward to for my daughter's sake. And, uh, and we're watching it. And I mean, you know, I, I hated it. But I just remember sitting there thinking to myself about my, my son, who was just a few months old at this point. I was like, I don't want him to see this movie. There's nothing in this movie for him because every single male character was just torn down. Even the male characters, which were, which were pretty good, which were, were decent in the first one, were torn down and seen to be as, as either bad or useless. Mm, right? Like yeah, either, either needed to be done away with or they needed to remove themselves so the, the ladies could step up and save the day. So, yeah, I, I see those same things as well and concerns with raising children. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you know, just one of the things that I go back to is our, our gender confusion today and how I think our culture is trying to figure out is gender a hardware issue or a software issue to put it, um, in like, in terms of how Douglas Murray has written about it. Is it just an issue of like what makes us male and females? What is what we're made of, does it only boil down to genitalia or is it, um, is it something that we just feel on the inside? And whenever we respond from a more, uh, whether it be just a generally conservative viewpoint or from a biblical viewpoint, we often try to root it just in the hardware and say, no, your biology determines it, which I agree with, right? Like God creates us and we can see the evidence of his creation in our biology. But also do wonder too if uh, God also does um, create us with some software that makes us more masculine, more feminine, if that makes sense. Yeah. You well, know, I if, definitely if, think... if he does put into us some of these more masculine traits, instincts and desires and, 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 and a more masculine spirit. Yeah. I'm not convinced that all of it is culturally constructed. I think there are things that certainly our culture in the past, and I think for, for reasons, um, it wasn't as if it was arbitrary in my opinion. I think those roles that men and women often played, uh, were sort of, uh, for the best of both in the way that they had negotiated those in culture. But I do think there are certainly things that by being made male and female and the fact that that hardware to use your term, our biology is, is, more at work within our personality and our interests, our genetics and hormones play a significant role, sometimes more than we recognize. But increasingly, I'm finding myself talking about gender in terms of responsibility. I think I probably even did it a moment ago when we were talking about it. But that if God creates male and female and calls both good, and if by his sovereignty I am born either male or female, then there's something about my life and my pursuit of becoming like Christ that means stewarding, taking responsibility for that gender that I've been given. We live in a time where um, so much of who I am, the act of self-expression or expressive individualism, is the highest pursuit of human life. How do I express myself? How do I make decisions for myself? How do I create for myself a meaningful and unique self-expression and identity in the world? And what we've been doing over the last few years is including gender as a part of that conversation of self-expression. And I think it's important to recognize that as believers, our first act is not self-expression, self-promotion, but our first act is submission. How do I submit myself to God and bring myself in line with his created intended purpose for my life. And a part of that for a long time Christians have recognized a part of that is is my identity, my calling, my disobedience, I submit those things to God. But I think it's increasingly important for us as believers to recognize that also a part of that submission is my gender. That if I am experiencing true gender dysmorphia, or if I'm feeling pressure from culture that perhaps I might have a happier or more meaningful life as another gender, that those can be very real experiences, but they don't override that fundamental responsibility of submitting my gender to God and bearing that gender that by his sovereignty he's given me with responsibility as an act of worship towards Christ's likeness. That male and female are both good 
and that if God has given it to me, even outside of my feelings, my ideas, there is an inherent goodness in conforming my life to his created purposes for me. That's an act of responsibility at the end of the day. Mm. That's super good. That's really, really good. And I like that you, that you put it that way because whenever we look at, okay, what are the responsibilities that God has given to, uh, that he has attached to the gender that he has given me, that I am called to live out, it gives us a fixed point that we can then attach the different uh, unique traits and, and experiences of our life too. So in other words, if you're a woman who has uh, some more, uh, a few traits and, or instincts we might say, which are more typically masculine, then we recognize, well, that doesn't make you a man. Um, and it's okay that you're a woman who has some of those more masculine personality traits or, or instincts. But the fixed point of what does God call me to in my responsibility as a, as a woman uh, helps you to interpret and figure out how do I live out who I am in the context of the responsibilities that God's called me to. And the same goes for a man who has, you know, some more uh, feminine personality traits or, uh, or, or even instincts and so on. He still has those fixed points of what does God call me to do that I know as being a man and with my personality and with my instincts and so on. So having that fixed point is, is everything and it's revealed to us in God's word. Yeah. That's and part really, of the reason really I like responsibility as a word is it doesn't mean you're an expert, right? Responsibility just, we get it from the word responsive. I, I show up, I take responsibility. I put myself into the position, I answer. Uh, that's what we're being asked to do with our genders. It doesn't mean it doesn't mean you perfectly fit the mold of the paragon, paragon male, right? Uh, that everything in your life is conformed to the ideal masculine. It doesn't mean you're an mm -hmm. expert. It doesn't mean that every you know how to do all the things that are expected of you as a man. A responsibility does not mean that I fit the mold perfectly or I'm an expert. It just means that I'm willing to show up. I'm willing to say, okay, God, for whatever reasons by your sovereign will, you have made me a man. How do I steward that gender well towards Christ likeness? How do I become more like you, given the fact that you've asked me to do it as a man or as a woman? Uh, that responsibility, that responsiveness doesn't mean you're an expert. And I think you described that as well, too. It doesn't mean you have to hit certain marks or cross off certain things on a checklist to be a man. You are, by God's design, male or female. It's good. So how do you take responsibility for that and mature that into Christ likeness? That's really, really good. A lot of more things we could talk about, but but I, I want to end that there. That's super good. Anything that you want to leave us with before we uh, close out this conversation? Yeah, well, I'm grateful for the chance to talk about it. So if you're a man out there and you find yourself wrestling with these things, um, I think manhood at the end of the day is one of those things that if you aim directly at it, how do I make myself a man? How do I make myself a man? You tend to miss and, and you end up with a kind of caricature of what a man is that the real work you should be aiming at is Christ. How do I grow to be more like Christ? And I think you will find that as you pursue Christ, who you are as a man becomes a fruit of that process. And I think a day comes where you, you are more of a man, not by having had proved it or conformed yourself to it, but by taking this life that you've been given and maturing it into Christ's likeness, you become that thing that God has called you to. So I would encourage men, uh, as much as the controversy swirls around masculinity, just keep pursuing Christ, keep humbling yourself, trying to understand the instincts that work within you to mature those into Christ's likeness. And that sense of manhood, I believe, is there by God's grace. Absolutely. Well, I've really enjoyed this conversation, Chase. Thank you so much for your time today uh, and for this book. I'm going to have the book and uh, as well as the online assessment that we had talked about, all those things linked in the show notes. So you guys who are interested in the book or anything else from Chase, I'll have his blog posted as well and podcast. Um, go check out the show notes so that you can get those things, uh, so that you can order the book uh, and uh, get a lot out of it. So Chase, once again, just thanks so much for your time today. Yeah, thank you. I really enjoyed it. Great conversation. Thanks for listening. I hope this episode provided you with biblical clarity to live with confidence in our confusing world. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and review. To catch up the latest from me, you can go to my website, AaronChamp.com. While you're there, subscribe to my newsletter so that you can be updated anytime I share new content. You can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Aaron M. Champ. Thanks again.
us again, and I'll see you next time. Until then, hold fast.